thank you very much for that extraordinary tour d'horizon of all the problems and your uh, your wildly enthusiastic and encouraging conclusion. So it's, uh, but it certainly illustrated very well the need for mutual accommodation and the raison d'etre of Bill's book. So we appreciate your comments very much and look forward to the question and answer period after we hear from our friend, Tom Mulcair. Tom, can we turn it over to you? Thank you so much, uh, Bill. And I have to say it's an incredible honor to be part of a panel with Martin Wolf. It is exactly as you say, an incroyable tour d'horizon uh, of all of these issues that are affecting the world on the economic and on the moral side. I, I really enjoyed uh, listening to you, Martin, and I think we're gonna have during the question and answer period occasion to go into it in greater detail. Mr. McDonald, pleasure to be with you as well today. And I have to say that uh, I very much enjoyed your book, but uh, I was lucky uh, to have been able to read it. So let me explain what I mean by that. Um, COVID obliged, uh, my colleague from Trent, uh, Mike Perry, contacted me early on and wanted to find out if I'd be interested in taking part in today's event, and I'm delighted to have been able to. Um, so the library, he, he had them, be, because of COVID, he had them send me um, the electronic copy uh, of Mr. McDonald's book, uh, except it was uh, the book of Donald McDonald, the chairman of the Commission on the Economic Union and development prospects for Canada. Now I enjoyed that book, uh, but I had to share with my friend, uh, Mike Perry, my surprise, that it was to be the object of today's panel. Um, Mike quickly arranged for me to receive a hard copy uh, of the Wright McDonald Future of Canada book, uh, along with six cans of Fenelon ale from uh, the Kawartha Lakes area, where he ran for us uh, in, in the NDP. It was sort of an, an atonement, and of course it worked, and I accepted it. Now, in preparing for the new series, at the session at the L'Université de Montréal, where I teach, Madame Sauvé, again, COVID of Deeds, asked me if I would be kind enough to empty out my mailbox, which had been accumulating uh, things uh, for several months now. And so I went into the university, and much to my surprise, I received this, my second copy of uh, today's book, with a note from William A. McDonald explaining to me that you know, he was sending, they were sending several thousand copies to, as they said, academics, political leaders, public service officials, professionals, and the media. Now, since I checked off most of those boxes, I was delighted to have my personal copy with that note from William A. McDonald. But I am gonna tell you right now that I'm sending that copy, which doesn't have any of my dog ears or markings to the library at Trent so they can have that copy as well. This McDonald memoir has proven extraordinary. And I, jamais deux cent trois, of course, we've had another John A. McDonald in this case, go through quite a lot in Montreal in the past week as we've been going through mutual historical accommodations. But that's for the next uh, debate here uh, uh, with uh, the, the folks at the Monk School. Half of the time that Canada has existed, William A. Macdonald has been able to observe the country and its leaders. He comes out of Quebec and of Montreal. That gives him special insights to some of the things that have required mutual accommodation over the years. What I'd like to look at today is going to dovetail somewhat on what Martin Wolf was saying before with regard to free trade agreements that have had an important influence around the world and their effect on something that is going to be crucial around the world in terms of mutual accommodation, and that is accommodating the environment and the economy. Uh, William A. Macdonald, in his book, goes through this issue quite a bit. He talks about a no or low carbon pipeline, how you would get to no carbon in, in terms of a fossil fuel pipeline perhaps requires a bit more discussion, but the idea is there. That in Canada, for example, we would have to look at the creation of an infrastructure that would allow us to continue to exploit our natural resources, as we've done over the years, and plug ourselves into the world. But right now, again, as Martin said before, we're in a world that's quite different from anything that we've seen before. The international order is being 
turned on its head in many regards, not the least of which with, is with regard to the environment and to the economic rules. In the fabric of McDonald's work, he, he goes into our obligations internationally and talks about big issues like the rewriting of the North American Free Trade Agreement. That trade agreement was remarkable in many respects, but it also was the first international agreement that had a separate chapter on the environment. It was interesting that on the left, the progressive left, we were often very concerned about the investor state provisions. And lo and behold, it's a right-wing populist American president, Donald Trump, who pulled out the investor state provision from the NAFTA, and the new agreement is exactly what the left had been asking for for years, making sure that decisions could be made on health and the environment and our care for our obligation to future generations, and not just on the basis of economic priorities and who was able to invest. Internationally, those trade agreements have actually played a key role in determining the future of the planet. And it's very interesting to look at how we speak to each other, and that's why I so admire the tone of Mr. McDonald's book. It's generous, it's open, and it's always looking for solutions. With regard to international trade agreements and the environment, let's bore down a little bit and see how we got to where we are today. Because despite the pause that uh, nature's been enjoying in the incremental increase in greenhouse gases, the fundamentals haven't changed. And as things start back up again, we're going to be on a track to cause immense harm to future generations and to the planet itself, and indeed to biodiversity. There's a WWF report that just came out on that subject. So Mr. McDonald is right when he talks about some of the key players in his book. He talks about our relationship, for example, with China. We have for, uh, an agreement with China that is similar to an investor state agreement that has seen Chinese companies buy Canadian energy companies like Nexon. And then the real question becomes, can Canada enforce new rules on the environment, or are we going to be told that we're interfering with the ability of this state-owned, it's the Chinese National Oil Company that owns it now, this, this government agency is now operating in Canada, and would those new rules under international law, under the agreement at the very least, come into conflict with their ability to continue? Would we be allowed to get tougher on the environment? If we look at the international laws right now, we, have, we can remember what Dominique de Villepin uh, said early on with regard to Kyoto, and it was, it was interesting in that it, it meets the proposal that is being made by two former American politicians, uh, in, in Mr. Schultz um, and uh, Mr. Baker have come up with a proposal that would see the imposition of a carbon tax, a very serious carbon tax, in exchange for letting oil companies off the hook for past transgressions and let them off the hook for the big lawsuits that are currently taking place in New York and in California. That's the future of these things. If we're going to get to the result of keeping global warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade, which is very, very difficult to do, and maximum two during this century, we're going to have to look at morally vexing proposals like that one. With regard to the international trade agreements, if we don't learn, as Baker and Schultz tell us to do, to internalize the cost and attribute the greenhouse gases to the right party as things are extracted, shipped, become a product, internalizing that pollution. If we don't learn how to do that, there will be no way for us to ever meet our international obligations. Martin Wolf pointed out before, of course, that with the current administration in the US, we're in a unique situation. The US has withdrawn from the Paris Accord. But interestingly enough, the first two countries to withdraw from Kyoto were countries that you wouldn't spontaneously see as environmental outliers. It was Canada and Australia. But, but what do those two countries have in common? Uh, it, it's worth noting that international trade agreements of the kind that Martin describes have actually had a downward pressure on the working condition, and the living conditions and, and the earnings of the average family in both of those countries. 
that result made it quite easy for right-wing parties to use, in both cases, in Canada and Australia, the wording of their election campaigns was identical. That a carbon levy was, quote, a tax on everything. So perhaps it wasn't surprising that Canada and Australia went on to become the first countries to withdraw from Kyoto. But how do you get there? How can we stop exporting our pollution and giving ourselves a clear conscience and then importing it back from the country that made it? If international trade agreements are all about having a level playing field and making sure that you couldn't find excuses to slap tariffs on somebody else's products, it's fair to say that if the other country can produce a ton of aluminum cheaper than you can, go out and buy it. But if that aluminum in, in the other country in the Middle East is coming from a huge factory that is being fueled entirely, and the electricity produced entirely by burning bunker fuel, is that the same ton of aluminum as the ton of aluminum made from hydroelectric clean renewable power in Kitimat, BC, or in Saguenay, Quebec? Is that a fair trade? We can't get to a solution like Mr. Uh, McDonald is asking us to do with China and with other countries that are producing large quantities of greenhouse gases without looking at the, these important questions. With regard to what Canada can do specifically, I think that there are other areas where we have expertise that we're just not using outside, of course, of the environment. In Russia right now, there is a government in place that is betraying all the hope of the dismantling of the Soviet system. We've seen the invasion of Crimea and certain sections on the Russian-Ukraine border, for example. Now, there is a situation in Canada that makes it very, very difficult for any government to push anything that would put into question the ability of Ukraine to keep claiming sovereignty over those areas. And yet, realpolitik dictates that at some point we're going to have to have an adult conversation because this situation is not about to change. Since a lot of what's happening there has specifically to do with whether or not the Russian minority had language rights, education rights, that's an area where Canada has great expertise. Instead of just finger wagging and walking away and imposing sanctions, which were all part of the, the work that had to be done, maybe we could have played a more proactive role. That mutual accommodation on the language front here in Canada is something that could be a lesson. In the, United, in, in the European Union right now, the various instances having to do with human rights have come up with decisions that are for us as Canadians an anathema saying, for example, that the French government, to name that one, but several others have followed suit, is entitled to ban Muslim women from wearing even a headscarf. The result of that has been that Muslim moms in France have been told that they can't even accompany their kids on a school trip because, of course, the school is the state and the state must remain neutral religiously. That's turning the whole notion of freedom of religion and neutrality of the state on its head, using it as an arm to hit religious minorities instead of a shield to protect them in the practice of their religions. Again, there Canada can and should be playing a positive role. I think that this on the international stage is the way that we can come to a situation where people see in Canadian values, in the way we look at things, something that can be very positive and can be transported to other countries. I like the word that uh, Martin used when he talked about norms. And I'm gonna make one final pitch with regard to both internal politics and international politics with, with regard to this question of norms, which I sometimes would call ethical considerations. They're, they're obviously questions of integrity and they go to the very heart of politics, which is often the, the poor cousin in any discussion of public policy. In his work, Mr. McDonald expresses the view that Mr. Trudeau was right to not respect his oft-repeated promise to bring in democratic reform. 
that's an interesting debate. Uh, and um, Mr. McDonald has very cogent arguments why it was a good idea not to proceed to democratic reform that would have started moving us away, as Mr. Trudeau had promised, from the current British-inspired system of first-past-the-post to something more European uh, that we, we often see in, involving something that is more proportional. Mr. McDonald also says that Mr. Trudeau did the right thing in buying the Kinder Morgan pipeline, saying that that was, was a good move. Again, a very interesting subject of debate. I, I happen to disagree on the substance of that, but it's, it's a good subject of debate. But where I fundamentally disagree is where we forget about the integrity issue there, the, the morality issue, the ethical issue. Now, I'm not saying that any position that, that is in favor of maintaining our electoral system or of buying a pipeline is immoral. But what I am trying to say is that the politics of public policy, both internally and internationally, has to be a reflection of our fundamental values. And one of those values is when you make that electoral bargain with the voting public and you tell them, vote for me and I will stop subsidizing oil companies. And then you go and buy the oil pipeline that will make their lives easier, and that is a direct subsidy. If you make a promise, and we had actually counted more than 2,000 occurrences where Mr. Trudeau promised that he would change the electoral system and that 2015 was to be, quote, the last election under the first past the post system, and then you just throw that away, Again, you can have good reasons for throwing it away. Mr. McDonald explains them in the book. But there is a fundamental question of integrity involved in that, I believe. And that bargain with the voting public is not something that can be tossed aside as lightly as it has been. There are numerous other examples. I did get invited to talk today mostly about the international side of this. And I find that the part of Mr. McDonald's work that is the most promising, the most interesting, is with regard to China. My, I've had the good fortune of, of traveling to China and, and meeting President Xi, uh, in, especially during a state visit with my friend David Johnston, who was then the Governor General. And it was interesting because as things worked out, it was the night when, of course, a Chinese dissident who had received the Nobel Prize died in prison when we were having that supper. That's an eye opener. Um, I didn't believe, um, I wear my name Thomas well, I, I, it took everything to convince me that it was true, uh, that members of the Falun Gong uh, were actually having organs harvested, but it seems to have been pretty well established by very credible international human rights groups that that is the case. We've been through the Second World War, I'm not gonna diminish uh, the importance of something that everybody understands and, and, and lecture on that, but. Is it possible that we're still dealing with China as if we didn't know what's happening to the Uyghur um, Muslim minority in, in, in Western China? And what are we doing about it? I, I was sitting in the Canadian consul, consulate in, um, in Hong Kong with um, Aaron O'Toole, as it works out, and a couple of other MPs. So we were on a trip that had included uh, Vietnam and, uh, and Indonesia. And we were being lectured by an employee of the Canadian government who was telling us, because we, some of us had intentions of meeting some dissidents, we were being ordered not to meet with Chinese, uh, with, with the Hong Kong dissidents who, who wanted to maintain this separate system, maintain it separate from China and maintain their rights. I found that shocking, uh, that, that that would be the official position of the Canadian government. I found it even more shocking that they would try to tell sitting members of parliament who had been duly elected what they should do. But I find that um, with regard to China, the, the final analysis, the final word of Mr. McDonald is the most important. We've got to hit reset on that relationship. But I think that the most important thing that we can bring to that com conversation is our view that there are fundamental issues involving human rights, that have to be discussed and have to be part of the conversation. Now, I've never been anyone who's been prompt or prone to lecture China. I know that any country that's approaching one and a half billion people that is capable, by and large, of providing shelter and, and food and education and medical care in a 
well-structured society to that many people it doesn't need a lot of lecturing from others who often come up short in many of those categories. And indeed, during my first meeting, uh, when I was leader of the official opposition with the then Chinese ambassador in Ottawa, I was lectured and saying, well, if you ever want to be able to discuss with us anything, you'd better not talk about human rights. I found that off-putting. Uh, obviously, I wasn't going to be told uh, what to think or do or say. But I do find that that is the thing where Canada is going to have to find its, its moral compass. We're going to have to be able to have trade with other parties. We often find aspects of their, of their discourse uh, repugnant. And I do agree fundamentally, though, with, with Mr. McDonald, that it is time to hit reset on that relationship. But I think that morality, integrity, and human rights are going to be ha have to be part of the discourse. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention one thing in passing uh, with regard to the book, even though I was asked to talk about the international side. But when I read this part uh, in the book um, on the NDP saying that it was, quote, pie in the sky idealism, um, I, I had to disagree ever so slightly, Mr. McDonald, with uh, that characterization of the party that I led for, for several years. Uh, you, much to your credit, you're very fair, and you mentioned that our universal free um, transportable medical care system that we're very proud of in our country is something that the NDP worked out in Saskatchewan and that was brought in uh, nationally. And that's a good thing. Um, I would add that there are other things like the Canada Pension Plan that are the work of the CCF NDP. I'm not going to give a long list, but uh, I do find that there's a bit of a parti pris when I re read something that abrupt and uh, I felt that I had to mention that despite the fact that I found almost all other aspects of the book quite enlightening and I had no trouble agreeing with many of the things you said. So I'll leave it there for now and I'm very much looking forward to having the occasion to listen to, uh, to people who have been uh, taking part in this and to take your questions and, and try to provide some answers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. I appreciate your comments very much.